Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Uh, this is a production outside of Israeli News Live. And yes, later this evening, in about an hour or so after this broadcast, you will be seeing Israeli News Live as well. Very important news tonight. There has been uh, a major st uh, stabbing attack in Tel Aviv, uh, leaving 10 people uh, in serious condition. Some of them were killed, including an American tourist. Anyway, going on into our broadcast this evening of Danun Institute of Biblical Research. Uh, this is something that we normally do on Shabbat, on uh, uh, Yom Shabbat, which is Saturday. Uh, and But we did not get a chance to do our, our message this Saturday. So I thought I'd throw that in uh, in between our news broadcast this week here. And our message tonight is, who is this man called Jesus? Or Yeshua being the Hebraic form of uh, uh, Jesus' name. Some uh, of our brothers and sisters call him Yahshua uh, from, the, uh, from the, the letter Yod, from the yod heh vav -He of the Tetragrammaton, uh, believing that he is God. And it is interesting because uh, there is many different passages in the Bible that do suggest that Yeshua was none other than God manifested in the flesh here on earth. Let me share with you some things that over the years the Lord has revealed to me that I think might be a blessing to you as well. Yeshua walking on the water. That's one of the most favorite things that really got my attention years ago. If we read it in Matthew 14 verses 26 and 27, we read, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And I always thought it was interesting how they said, it's a spirit. But what was Yeshua doing when he came to them walking on the water? We know many of the things that Yeshua did in his life ministry was only trying to show the Jewish people of his day who he really was. He didn't have to come out and say who he was. His own actions that he did proved who he was. And in fact, his walking on the water was no different. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, and it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, or in Hebrew, brooded across the face of the waters there. Literally, right over, just kind of like the Spirit of God was walking on the water. So when Yeshua came to his disciples when they were in the ship, and they had left off for, uh, without him, he'd went up to pray. But when he came back later, he comes walking on the sea. They're all frightened. What was he doing? He was showing that the same God in the beginning, according to Genesis 1-2, that was walking on the water there, was again walking on the water, but this time in a body of flesh. Very interesting. So why does Yeshua heal the blind man? It's another one that's very interesting. It's not so much a matter of why did he heal him, but what he did that again was an outward sign telling us who he was. We know the story in John chapter 9 verses 6 and 7. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. You know, we've actually, I, the first time I think I even did the video about this particular discovery here was in Israel, and it was actually at the Pool of Siloam. And so many people going there to this pool there, it, it is a major tourist attraction. It's there in the uh, in a Arabic neighborhood right there near the old city. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of believers like to go there because why? The blind man was told to wash there even as Yeshua said. And it is the very pool. It is the ancient pool that he told this blind man to wash in. But you see, the miracle was not the fact that he washed his eyes in the pool of Siloam. It was the fact that he was showing who he was. That's what he was doing. If we look back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. How did God form that man? He formed him from the dust of the ground. He took the dirt and made clay out of it, and formed that man, and then breathed in his nostrils. Breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and that life was God's own life in a plural 
form because both Adam and Eve were in that same body. No wonder why the Bible says that a man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Literally, the word cleaved in Hebrew is like glued to his wife. What was it? God, when he had taken and made Adam, Adam was, was a creation of God himself. And God being both mother and father for us, he's both mother and father, he taken and made that, that body and he put Eve inside of them and she was glued to him, so to speak, stuck to him. As the Bible even says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and stick to his wife or glued to his wife. See, God had taken from him own self and put both Adam and Eve together and they were glued together as one. So many things that God does. But in this case here, he was showing that he was God. When he took and made the clay and put it on this blind, blind man's eyes, and then he began, he was able to see. You know, it's actually written in other places about Yeshua. This is historical documentation that's written out there that Yeshua as a child would take of clay and make little doves out of the clay, and then would clap his hands like that, and they would fly away, come to life and fly away. I believe it to be true. Interesting, the things that he did. Anyway, Yeshua speaks to the woman at the well, another fascinating story. Now, I'm doing all these here for you for a reason, and you're going to find that out at the very end of this broadcast there. I found an amazing thing that Yeshua says to Thomas one of his apostles. And I'm going to share that with you here in a little bit. This is why we're going into this, because it's showing you who Yeshua really is. And by the way, some people might say, oh, Steve's a oneness. He doesn't believe the Trinity. And, you know, I believe that both of them have truth and they both have error in the way that it's taught, not in the way that it is, because truly there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But as Yeshua said, and this is in the Humane Gospel, he said the three are one. Until you make the three one, you still don't have it right. And so, and the oneness that believe is just like your finger, one only like that, that's not correct either. So, watch what he does here. This is another interesting one here as well. Yeshua speaks to the woman at the well. We, we know this story from the book of John. Uh, chapter 4, starting with verse 7, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Yeshua saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman into Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh the drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and of who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest not have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou this living water? Well, we know that the debate goes back and forth between her and him. But what was it? He said he would give her living waters that flows from the valley. Now, Yeshua was actually giving this woman a sign, and that sign was a sign that was fulfilled on Calvary when his side was pierced by the Roman soldier, when both blood and water came from his side. But where does that sign come from? Why is that a sign? He's telling her, if you knew who it was that spoke to you, I'd give you water that you don't come to draw from this well anymore. Well, we have to look back into the story. Now, there's two different times where Moses smites a rock. In one case, in the book of Exodus, God commands Moses to smite the rock. And yet in another story, I believe it's in the book of Deuteronomy. I could be wrong on that. God tells Moses to speak to the rock. But in anger, because of the children of Israel, Moses goes and he smites the rock twice. You see, Yeshua was going to be smitten once, not twice, only once. But what happens here in the book of Exodus? Now, their children of Israel are complaining. They're complaining because they they're, they're thirsting to death. And they said to Moses, you brought us out here to die? And we read in Exodus 17, 6, Behold, I will stand before 
uh, thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Mirabah because of the chiding of the children of Israel, because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Well, it's no different than today and it was no different than 2,000 years ago but even today they still the people argue and fuss over whether or not Yeshua was God manifested in the flesh on the earth people just don't seem to be able to get that and it was the same thing back then they were they were they not only were they complaining about nothing to drink and thirsting to death but they're also was saying you know I mean, here God had already done all these great miracles throughout the entire time of the Exodus there, even the crossing of the Red Sea and the water parting. And now they say, well, I guess there's no God among us anymore. Moses don't have the gifts anymore like he had before. So God tells Moses, take the elders, actually, we don't have this on the screen here for you, but take the elders of Israel with you and go out and smite the water rock that it bring forth its waters. Now see, what was it? That was a sign letting you know that when the word of God, when the rock Yeshua came forth, that he would take the elders of Israel and they would take and smite him and condemn him, and, but they would take that smiting by the elders of Israel in order to bring forth that water. And that water was the waters of life. Okay, now I want to share with you how this works here. All right, now you have to you have to look at this here. In the case with the story of the little woman, see, he takes and he tells her, "If you knew who it was that was speaking to you, you'd ask me for a drink, and you wouldn't have to come here to draw anymore." He says, "For out of your belly will flow water." rivers of water of life that was that sign see he knew that he was that rock do you know in the Hebraic language it's written Hatsua it's the one place where the definite article hey is used in front of the word Sua which is rock and it's actually there's two times that this happens in the biblical account and the rabbis know that it's the same rock even though it's two different locations where this takes place at and they can't understand that but Paul even says that Yeshua was that rock. And the fact that he was smitten and the reason, see, remember, when Moses smote the rock, the water came forth. And that water represented the water of life. I've always believed that that water actually came from the Garden of Eden. That's another story altogether. I won't get into it, but it's just the way the terminology in Hebrew is written there. It comes out of. How can something come out of uh, where, where it's something that's already in? Uh, it's a, like I said, long story. I won't get into that right now. But when Yeshua, when they took him on the, and the, and the, and the elders of Israel, when they condemned him, they handed him over to the Romans. They put him on a cross to crucify him. And when that Roman soldier pierced his side, then what happened? The Bible record records that both water and blood came from his side. That was a sign to the Jews that he was that rock. When that water came from his side, separated from the blood, it was showing that he was the rock that Moses smote in the wilderness. What are they doing smiting him there? But he had to be smitten. You know, it's even written in the book of Adam and Eve, the same thing that speaks about where, where God tells Adam. He sends forth, in fact, it's interesting. The word says in the book of Adam, I think it's chapter 4, that he sent forth his word, the word of God to Adam. And he, because Adam had taken and, and, and Adam had tried to kill himself, him and Eve, according to the book of Adam of Eve, and they took, when God raised them up, they took the blood that, that had fallen on the ground, they put it on the altar, and God even asked him, he says, what did you do that for? He said, I never asked you for blood. But they did it, trying to give God an offering. But God says to them, I will come. In, in, the, in, in your descendants, I will become a man and become your descendants and I will give my life's blood for you. 
So don't think that, Brother Steve, I know some people think, oh, Brother Steve, don't believe in the blood of Yeshua. Yes, I do. In fact, I believe it far greater than most do. You don't know the extent of what it really is. You don't know the full extent of what communion is either. Many don't. They say they do, but they really don't. I should teach on that one day. You'd be surprised to know how deep the communion was that Yeshua had that, that particular time when he was here on the earth with his disciples. Much deeper than what most people realize. All right, so anyway, his side was pierced. It was thrust through. In fact, in the book of Zechariah, when the Jews look upon him whom they pierced, that's kind of interesting. Zechariah says, you'll look upon him whom you pierced or who you thrust through. And they'll weep and mourn as a family lost their only son. But when that water came out separated from his blood, it was an open sign to Israel that there was the rock that Moses smote. There was their sign all along showing that he is the rock. And if you look in the Jewish Bible, look in our, in our Tanakh, it says that Hashem was on that rock. Yahweh, as you call him. Nobody knows his right name. Zephaniah approves that. Nobody knows it. Nehemiah Gordon, I, I love my brother. I appreciate him. And, I, and I've told him, I've written him about this. We can't know the name. Zephaniah says it won't be known until Israel is surrounded by armies and ready to be overthrown. Then it'll be revealed. Mm, let's move along. No, that was just another great, wonderful thing the Lord had shared with me. Why did he breathe on his apostles after the resurrection? Another sign to the Jews of who he was. John 20, verse 22. And when he had, had said thus, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit is the right translation. Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Why did he breathe on them? Again, he was showing, not only was he the God that took the dirt and formed it and put it on the clay of the blind men that like the same God showing that he is the same God that formed Adam, but he's also, if he breathed on them, received ye the Holy Spirit. That's what he did with, with Adam when Adam and Eve was one body in Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. See? Right there in red. See, he breathed in his nostrils. Nishmat chayim. The chayim is the eternal life of God in a plural form. If it had just been chay, like he says here at the end, adam chaya. See, that's the singular form. But the chayim was God's own life being breathed into Adam, into this man, mankind. Really, Adam represents mankind because God breathed two spirits of life inside of this man. And he becomes a living soul. He, as an individual, was a living soul. But then we find later that God takes from Adam. He takes from him his wife, Isha. And by the way, Isha comes from the very word fire of Yahweh. And also Ish is what he was called before even being called Adam. He was called Ish, which also is a fire of Yahweh. And you take the compound of those two together, and that's exactly what you have. You have God and his life there present with them. So beautiful, guys. And this is why when God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, this is why Yeshua, back here, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive you the Holy Spirit. See, it's what he was doing in the Garden of Eden. He was breathing on them, breathing in. But in this case here, they were not living souls as of yet, and they were receiving. They, what were they receiving? This, the life of God was receiving the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Do you realize this is why Yeshua had to come and redeem us? One, he had to pay the price to redeem us. But the second reason why Yeshua actually came was in order to restore back the Holy Spirit to fallen man. Because he had lost, he had lost the Holy Spirit that he had need of. He needed that life like Adam had in the beginning. But when they fell and they sinned, they forfeited that right. So Yeshua come to buy all that back. Another great place to see this beautiful story of Yeshua. Again, another type. Now this here is just beautiful to me. It's in the story of Absalom. Absalom never recognized his father to be the anointed king. You know that? David, his father, 
Many of you know the story, if you might have seen the movie even as well. Absalom, his, his name actually in Hebrew means Av, is Av Shalom, which is my father is peace, which is only speaking of David's son, Yeshua. See, David says, why, do they, why does he call uh, my Lord, uh, sit thou on my right hand, I'll make thy enemies thy footstool. All right, David in the psalm calls Yeshua his Lord, his master. All right, but in this case here, Absalom or Absalom, my father is peace, is his name is referring to Yeshua itself. See, what's interesting though, Absalom, long story, you guys can go back and read it in the book of Kings and everything, but we know that he, he never fully recognizes that his father was anointed of God to be the king. He got jealous and decided he wanted to be a king, so he did a coup. Very clever way he did this to overthrow his father. Now, the great warriors of David came together. They were willing to put down the rebellion, but David said, don't do it. He said, be too much bloodshed. He said, let him alone. And so David leaves peacefully. It's the same thing with Yeshua when he was here on the earth, and they, 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 they come to take Yeshua away, the Roman soldiers did, and Simon Peter grabs a sword and cuts off the high priest's servant's ear, and Yeshua said, put away your sword. Don't you know I could call 10,000 legions of angels right now? My father would steadily put them right here for me. This isn't a flesh and blood, blood, blood battle. All right? So, it's the same thing with David. So, anyway, David, he leaves. Now, interesting, David leaves 10 concubines behind and tells them to care for his house in his absence. When Yeshua leaves the earth, we read about in the New Testament, there are 10 virgins, five are wise and five are foolish. What is a concubine? It's a common law wife that's not had a proper marriage yet. The 10 virgins of Revelation, I think it's in Revelation there that speaks of in the New Testament, uh, those 10 virgins represent those 10 concubines. They are to what? Care for God's house. His what? His house. Who? In other words, what are the 10 virgins supposed to be doing? You're supposed to care for the Jewish people. Now, Absalom did abuse them openly and publicly, because I've had many people say to me, you know, Steve, you know, the Jews are not nice to the Christians. I realize that. But even David as a type left his concubines behind and said, care for my house in my absence. In other words, care for the Jews in my absence. Yeshua does the same. So many beautiful types. Do you know when he went over the hill and Shimei, Saul's son of his lineage anyway, comes out spitting on David, throwing stones at him and everything else. His own men wanted to cut his head off. David said, let him alone. He said, God told him to do that. And again, David being a type of Yeshua when he would come, and they spit on Yeshua as well. See? So many things that happened to David were happening as well. Do you know, though, that what's interesting, though, about Shimei, and I know it's a little off as far as recognizing him to be God. It's just some beautiful stories there. But what's really interesting in the story of David there is when Shimei, David leaves. In fact, David also says, sends back two, this is after he leaves, he sends back two men. He said, get the people in one mind and accord. Get them in one mind and accord, then I can return. Yeshua sends back two witnesses to get the people in one mind and one accord so he can return for his bride. Do you know who was the first one to meet David, though, down at the river when David did return? It was Shimei. Shimei, by the way, is a Benjamite. In the book of Zechariah, we find, and I think that's the 12th chapter there, we find that Israel is not in tribal order. You have the... It says that... Uh, let me just... Let's see if I've got... Yeah, I've got it handy right here. Let me just read it to you here. This is King James Version for those that are following along. I have different ones here, but just for the sake of uh, many people use the King James Bible, so I'll use this one here. I've got about five different translations sitting here with me. Um, anyway, David, um, this beautiful type where Shimei, he comes down there and he meets David at the river. 
and he cries out for mercy. And his men remembered the evil that he'd done. They wanted to kill him. David said, no man will die today. See, he has mercy on Benjamin. Why? He knew. Yeshua, Yeshua knew that it was the Benjamites that cried out for Yeshua's blood. He said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Well, that's exactly what he came to do, was to redeem Israel. The only thing is, is Israel just hasn't recognized it as of yet. In Zechariah 12, verse 10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, literally in Hebrew it's thrust through. And they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, and in the mourning of Hidromon and the valley of Gidon. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of, a, of David apart, and the wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, their wives apart, and the family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart. Now, all four of these families make up the house of Judah. And we don't have time to go into it all, but God said he promised to send the house of Judah home first if the house of Israel would not lift up its foot against the house of Judah. And why? The house of Judah is the one that sold out Yeshua. It wasn't the house of Israel. And so they're the first ones to come back to make right what they did wrong. And that's what we have right here in this beautiful story. Shimei, Nathan, Shimei was a Benjamite. Nathan and David were uh, the tribe of Judah. Levi was, of course, the Levites. Uh, and they all come back. And they're weeping and mourning for what they did. Now, I noticed also, uh, as, let's see, the mourning of, in Jerusalem, as the mourning of Hadramanon in the Valley of Megiddo. And that's another thing that's coming up, is that Valley, valley of Megiddo. Major thing is going to happen there. So anyway... So uh, another one, another interesting one as well is when David, when he wept so much at the death of Absalom, that used to always trouble me. Even as it bothered David's men, why is he weeping so much for Absalom? Well, then the Lord revealed to me why. He was a type of Yeshua. Absalom, he did what he did in ignorance, not recognizing the anointing of his father. The same with the house of Judah. They sold Yeshua out. They put him up there and had him crucified in ignorance. And Yeshua wept over Jerusalem just as David wept over Absalom at his death. And he said, How often I would have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, You shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. There's different translations of that, and I wish that I had time to bring them together for you, but I, I did not. You know, also one quick thing I just kind of quickly go through with you as well. The story of Joseph, many things are in there. The cup in Benjamin's back was another beautiful type out there as well of Yeshua. See, he put, he put his own cup, Joseph does. He doesn't reveal to them who he is. First time he puts the cup in, in before Benjamin comes down. He just puts the cup, he puts the money back in the neck of their sack. When they're going back home to their father, after he releases them from, from their captivity, they're going back home to their father. But he does, he does keep one brother back, and that was Simon. And he binds up Simon and he says, I won't, you, you won't see him until you come back with your youngest brother, Benjamin. Now, that's an interesting thing. He was not going to allow Simon go and them to get their brother until they brought Benjamin back. Now, by the way, Simon, his very name means he hears. Okay? He hears. But when he was bound, it was showing that the children of Israel's ears were bound to hearing the true word of God. Just like Reuben. Reuben means, his Reuben's own name, name means, behold a son. And Reuben was the one brother that was not willing to just have Joseph handed over the way they wanted to do with him. But while he was gone to go check on something else, they took and sold uh, Joseph out. And then he really mourned and lamented. But you know, the whole time when they were yelling at, at Reuben, 
You know, the whole, every time they would say his name, in Hebrew, a name is meaning, it's like a sentence. You know, they kept, it's like they were saying, behold a son, behold a son. You know why? Because Joseph was a type of the coming of Yeshua. Now, he doesn't reveal his identity to his own brethren when they come down there to Egypt to get grain because they're all starving to death. But he, put, he starts putting little reminders in there for them. Actually, it wasn't just reminders for them. It was reminders for the Jews today. When they stopped at that little hotel on the way back home and they found their money in the bag, you know, that was no coincidence. That was God reminding the Jews of today you rejected me when I was in the womb of my mother. There was no room for me there in the end there, so you sent me to the stable to be born. Then he took when Benjamin did come down, he still didn't reveal himself to Benjamin right off at the first, just like Israel's in their homeland today, and everybody thinks, well, they, didn't write, they don't know the Messiah now, must not be the real Jews, has nothing to do with that. They're there because they have to recognize who he is. Benjamin didn't they, they, when he went when Benjamin came down at first he didn't reveal himself either he allowed him to leave but he put his cup in his bag the innocent son that was never guilty of, of selling his own brother out but it was done for a twofold purpose one today to remind the Jews of today who were innocent of the blood of Yeshua 2,000 years ago but it's to let them know the cup is in your bag what will you do with this man called Jesus Yeshua and as well, it was to serve as a prophecy that the Benjamites would actually sell him out. That's what it stood for. Now, I ran across reading last night a very beautiful passage in the book of Thomas. The book of Thomas is a f fragment that was discovered back uh, at the turn uh, between the 18th, uh, 1800s, 1900s, right there at the, that early time frame there. There's been uh, several fragments found since then, but there was a, uh, a whole drove of uh, ancient documents found in Egypt. The Book of Thomas was one of those uh, documents were found there. And then, of course, since then, there's been many fragments that have, that have only proven the authenticity of the Book of Thomas, that it was a real, a real book. Most scholars date this, this particular find uh, on the fragments from the, from the time of around 75 to 150 A.D., one of the oldest writings of the Gospels, but it's not written in story format. It's only written in quotations. It's like a, quote, uh, a collection of quotations that Thomas writes that he says that Yeshua stated. And this was the one that really caught my eye. Was in, Of course, there's only one chapter, first chapter, 13th verse. He says here, Yeshua said to his disciple, Compare me to others and tell me who am I like. Simon Peter said to him, You are like a righteous messenger of God. Matthew said, You are like a philosopher. Thomas said to him, Teacher, my mouth is not capable of saying who you are like. Yeshua said, I'm not your teacher now that you have drunk. You have become drunk on... You have become drunk from the bubbling spring that I have tended. And he took him and withdrew and spoke three words to him. Ihaye asha ihaye. Now, I think King James translates that as I am that I am. Or I will be that which I will be. Or I will, I am. You know, you can translate it which way you want. It's very difficult to translate. Then he goes on to say, Now when Thomas returned to his comrades... They inquired of him, what did Yeshua say to you? Thomas said to them, If I tell you even one of, one of the words which he spoke to me, you will take up stones and throw them at me, and fire will come from the stones to consume you. When I saw this, it only confirmed to me all these other things that Yeshua did that we see in the Gospels that we have today, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the clay of the blind man forming the clay and putting it on his eyes, walking on the water, the woman at the well, everything that he did showing that he was God on earth. Isaiah says that when he speaks about forming him, yea, I have created him, gather you your witnesses in chapter 43, he said, behold, I am he. There's not another 
He is the creator. And he came down in the form of a man. And when he told this to Thomas, Ihaye Asha Ihaye, this is what God says to Moses at the burning bush. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. In the Hebrew tongue, it's written like this, Ve'yomer Moshe el ha'elohim, Hine anochi bo el b'nei Yisrael, ve'amati lachem elohim avotechem, shelachani aleichem, ve'amru li mashemo, and they will ask me, what is his name? Ma'omer elchem, what do I say to them? Ve'yomer Elohim el Moshe, and God said to Moses, Ihaye asha ihaye. Ve'yomer kota amar livne Yisrael, I am that I am. You will say, kota amar livne Yisrael to the children of Israel, ihaye shelachani eliachem. I am has sent me unto you. So when Yeshua says to Thomas, Ihaye Asha Ihaye. This also brings one other thought I wanted to share with you. When you look at Yeshua versus Yahshua, there is a lot of debate over what should be said there. In light of this, though, the e part from e ha, excuse me, e ha ye, is from the aleph and the vowel points that are there. But the ye, ye, the ye sound in e ha ye is where it is for the I am. And the ye goes very good with Yeshua. If he said to Thomas, and I believe the fragment to be of God, if he said to him, Ihaye, Asha Ihaye, then perhaps the Yeshua is more accurate for his name today. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israel, uh, excuse me, the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Stay tuned a little bit later this evening for our news broadcast. Shalom and God bless you.